depth has a surface, but not every surface has a depth. This is why we should strive to attend to the depth of things and not merely to the surface. Attending to the depth, however, is difficult because we have a problem. We are drawn to surfaces. We are fascinated by appearances. And the exhilaration of surfaces prevents a deeper engagement with whatever is not immediately evident to the senses. In our culture of organized distractions, the depth of things has largely receded from our view, leaving behind a flattened and hollowed out shell of appearances. With our eyes immobilized by our mobile devices, we live our lives on the surface in a fruitless search for meaning and fulfillment. At the same time, the world around us seems strangely devoid of God, drained of his presence, as if he too had receded from view together with the depth, so that now even the idea of God, like a fading memory, seems increasingly remote and inaccessible, hidden from our eyes, eclipsed by the blinding light of appearances. The Orthodox Church understands this situation as a consequence of mankind's separation from God. As described in the book of Genesis, the fall of mankind took place through an act of demonic deception, an error in human judgment, and the misuse of free will. The result was a shift of the mind's spiritual energy to a lower level of biological and animal life, a fallen mode of existence that altered and corrupted human consciousness. This shift of spiritual energy, in turn, brought about a radical inversion of human perception and cognition, the primary symptoms of which are, one, the disproportionate power of the senses, two, the mind's attachment to surface appearances, and three, the subjugation of reason to irrational sensations. In the language of the church, the mind's attachment to outward appearances and sensations is known as a passionate or impassioned condition. Derived from the Greek word pathos, the word passion means more than just strong interest or enthusiasm for something, like a passion for baseball or mountain climbing. The English word pathology perhaps comes closest to the sense of the Greek, since the root meaning of pathos is passivity, and a pathology is an illness or condition that we do not actively will to have, but is something we experience passively something which overtakes and overpowers us, and to which we succumb, not unlike an addiction. The passion is thus a pathology of the mind, a condition which impels the mind to attach itself to the outward material surfaces of things in the world. Through such attachments, the passions effectively conceal the depth of the world, obscuring the spiritual ground of creation and its inner unity. That creation is from God, who is its inner life and reality, is a basic teaching of the Orthodox Church, which sees creation as a theophany, a manifestation and reflection of God's love. And the Church teaches us that creation is, by its nature, transparent to its creator. The passions, however, render the transparent surface of the world opaque. Like clouds obscuring our vision, the passions cloud the mind and prevent it from seeing God's presence in the forms and textures of the natural world. The passions are interested in pleasure, not truth, and a mind dominated by the passions remains on the surface of things 
unable to perceive the presence of God in creation, just as it is unable to perceive the presence of God in Holy Scripture. With our perception limited in this way, we fail to grasp the deeper meaning of what is given to us in creation, and our failure to understand creation inevitably leads us to abuse creation. And this, I think, is the deeper cause of the environmental crisis. The impassioned mind does not seek to protect or preserve the world, but rather to satisfy its selfish desires through the exploitation and abuse of the world's material surface. Instead of a horizon open to the infinity of God, the world becomes simply a means to satisfy our base appetites and desires, an object to be exploited by those who are powerful and ruthless enough to do so. And creation, which should have been a revelation of God's love, has become instead the cause of global competition, aggression, and war in a never-ending struggle for material resources and profit. We have then two closely related points. First, that creation possesses a double or dual aspect, a surface and a depth, that is, an outward visible aspect on the one hand, and an inward invisible or spiritual aspect on the other. Second, this double aspect corresponds to the divided consciousness that we bring to and impose on the natural world when our mind is dominated by the passions which compulsively attach us to superficial appearances and sensations. Orthodox Christian thinkers have reflected deeply on these two points and many of them have seen the correlation of nature and mind symbolically expressed in the two trees in paradise which are mentioned in the book of Genesis, namely the tree of life and the tree of the, no the, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This interpretation of the two trees was established in the fourth century by St. Gregory the Theologian and St. Gregory of Nyssa, whose views were developed and solidified by subsequent theological thinkers, such as St. John of Damascus and St. Gregory Palamas. In what follows, I focus on the interpretation of the two trees put forward by St. Maximus the Confessor, which is based on the work of the two Gregories, but offers the most comprehensive account of this question within the Greek patristic tradition. Reflecting on the nature of the fall described in Genesis, Maximus states that Adam, who is also a symbol of universal human nature, quote, fell ill with the disease of ignorance concerning the origin of his existence in God, end quote. Instead of using the power of his mind to seek God in creation, Adam became engrossed in visible things through the power of his senses. Seeking sensory pleasure in creation, Adam discovered only pain and psychological fragmentation, which drove him to seek further and more intense pleasures, which in turn further estranged him from God. Maximus argues that Adam's confusion was so great that he mistook the visible creation for God and unwittingly made a God out of creation. Citing Romans 1.25, they worship created things rather than the Creator, Maximus suggests that Adam worshipped not simply creation, but his own body, which he loved and cherished more than God. This, according to St. Maximus, resulted in a rival form of worship, a rival liturgy, which fallen human beings established in place of the worship of God. Turning his attention to the symbolic meaning of the two trees, the confessor suggests that they signify two different levels or two different dimensions of creation. The tree of life represents the invisible 
and spiritual dimension of creation, while the tree of knowledge represents creation's visible and sense-perceptible dimension. From this point of view, creation presents us with a dual aspect, offering us either the potential for spiritual insight and knowledge, or the experience of irrational sensations and pleasures, depending on the frame of mind we bring to it. If we approach creation with a mind that is pure, we will move beyond its surface, enter into its hidden depth, and discern within it the presence of God. If, on the other hand, we approach creation with a mind dominated by the passions in order to satisfy our selfish desires, we will be bound to surface phenomena, abuse creation, and remain ignorant of the divine reality present in the world around us. Maximus sees the contrasting realities embodied in the two trees as something also present in the tree of knowledge, since by itself the tree of knowledge can be taken as a symbol of the created world. And I quote, One could also say that when the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is contemplated spiritually, it is found to contain the knowledge of the good. But when it is taken in a corporeal manner, it is found to contain the knowledge of evil, and those who partake of it solely in a corporeal manner become oblivious to divine realities." End quote. That the tree of knowledge marks a stage of progress to the tree of life, or simply encompasses that progression within itself, corresponds to the notion that Adam and Eve were created in an intermediate state, and if they kept the commandment about the one tree, they would be able to partake of the other, the tree of life. Like the disciples of St. Paul, they were like children who first needed to be fed with milk, after which they could partake of solid food. Thus, the tree of knowledge was given to them as a kind of trial, test, and exercise. Had Adam successfully completed this test, God would have allowed him to, quote, examine the creations of God together with God, and to acquire knowledge of them, not merely as man, but with the very grace, wisdom, and knowledge of creation that God has, end quote. Adam, however, chose to follow the counsel of the serpent, and aspire to become like God, but in separation from God and he attempted, through sense perception alone, to make his own the things of God without God, and before God, and not according to God, which is impossible. And the only knowledge he gained by his experience was the knowledge of what he had lost because of his disobedience. This knowledge was not beneficial to him, but was like a sick man's knowledge of his former health, which only troubles and torments his mind. Adam was called to cultivate nature, to name all things with knowledge, and to transform the world into a means of communion with God. But Adam rejected creation as communion with God and embraced mere appearances, and because of his decision, the earth became cursed. Thus, a new Adam was needed, Jesus Christ, the Son and Word of God incarnate, who in his own person united the created world with the uncreated God. To those who believe in him, he freely offers his own victory over sin and death. He does not, however, take away human freedom, and those who follow him must struggle to break the hold of sensation over reason, to resist the seductions of surface appearances so that creation can be embraced as the means of our communion with God. All that is required is, our, is that our power of free choice, the disposition of our will, remain faithful to Christ, who is present in each believer, assisting him in his struggles freeing him from his passions, and restoring his spiritual potential for communion 
and union with God. With the mind freed from its passions and attachments, human beings can resume the task of discovering the gracious presence of God concealed within creation. Our encounter with God does not take place apart from the material world or in opposition to it, but rather in and through the mystery of the created order. According to Saint Maximus, the Word of God has inscribed himself within the very fabric of creation like a spoken word transposed into written script, and thus he has made himself known, made himself legible, as St. Maximus says, in and through his creations. As if it were a kind of cosmic book, the elements of creation are mysterious syllables and signs whose hidden meaning is Jesus Christ, revealed to us in and through the material forms of the natural world. We read the book of creation not to acquire knowledge of creation, but knowledge of the Word, and not just to know Him, but to become like Him, to become by grace what He is by nature, and through Him to be united to God. Knowledge of God is not like ordinary knowledge, that leaves the knower unchanged, but rather transforms the knower into the very likeness of the one he knows. We might think that Maximus's reasoning here is simply the traditional philosophical notion that like knows like, that is, the belief that the mind is conformed to the form of whatever it thinks about, becoming the very thing that it comprehends. Now, St. Maximus, who was no stranger to Greek philosophy, would seem to agree with this when he says that through the habit of virtue, the mind becomes the very thing that it sees. However, this is much more than the classical doctrine of the mind becoming the object of its knowledge, since that describes merely ordinary knowledge, ordinary knowing, in which the mind naturally conforms to the object of its thought, through the power of its own proper cognitive activity. So, for example, the mind that becomes a stone, so to speak, in order to know the stone, does not acquire the stone's spiritual energy or activity. In all such cases, the energy or activity of the mind remains unchanged, whether it knows a stone, a rose, or a star. The mind's knowledge of God, on the other hand, is a radically different form of knowledge because through it, the mind becomes not the object of its knowledge, but another subject, since God freely gives his own qualities and his own attributes to the one who knows him. In other words, the mind that receives the knowledge of God does not receive another object of knowledge, but instead receives a new way of seeing, a new mode of being, which is the being of Christ. And this is why St. Paul is able to say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Such a mind knows things, not humanly, but divinely, which is why the Apostle elsewhere says, we have the mind of Christ. In yet another of his letters, Paul speaks directly of this transformation, noting that, quote, when a person returns to the Lord, the veil covering his mind is removed, and all of us who with unveiled faces reflect the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his likeness from glory to glory. Closely following St. Paul, St. Maximus describes this transformation in similar terms and language. He notes that the Word of God freely bestows his own qualities and attributes on the saints, who shine forth with the radiance of the Divine Presence like mirrors reflecting a source of light. And I quote, Having been wholly united with the Word, the saints were imbued with the Word's own qualities, 
so that they have become like the clearest of mirrors and thus have become reflections of the form of God the Word who gazes out from within them for they possess the fullness of his attributes. None of their human attributes have been lost but have simply yielded to what is better like air which in itself is not luminous but that has become completely mixed with light." End quote. Now, the reflection of light seen in a mirror does not exist by itself, but only in a dynamic and continuous relationship with the source of light placed before the mirror. This optical phenomenon is an analogy for the relationship of God to both human and non-human creation. As a mirror reflecting the light of the sun becomes itself a source of light, so too do the minds and the bodies of the saints reflect the light of God. As St. Maximus, Maximus explains, because of their love for God, the saints became light by participation in the one who is light, who, because of his love for man, becomes light in those who are light by participation, just as an archetype is present in its image. Maximus concludes his meditation on the two trees by taking up Paul's analogy of unveiled faces, which he uses to describe the mind's contrasting responses to the surface and the depth of creation. After affirming that, quote, only true and conscious love of God can deliver us from the grip of the passions, he says that, when we are filled with God's love, we shall no longer see the world with a carnal mind as we once did, when the face of our senses was uncovered, and when we mistook the superficial manifestation of created things as glory, when in reality it was the source of the passions. Now here, the uncovered face of the senses refers to the mind's fascination with the sensible aspect of the world and its surface phenomena grasped by the senses alone and driven by the passions. Such a face is in effect a broken mirror that dis distorts reality and conceals the true meaning of creation. To this face, St. Maximus contrasts a different kind of face, which is also a different kind of mirror, and while it is likewise uncovered, it produces a very different reflection, and I quote, with the uncovered face of the mind freed from the covering of carnal sensations, we will reflect through our virtues and spiritual knowledge the glory of God and be united to God by grace, with our minds being raised up beyond all ignorance and error. For in the same way that being ignorant of God, we deified creation, so too, having received the true knowledge of God, we will be ignorant of every passion and of all sensation. Maximus is saying that when we uncover the senses, we simultaneously cover the mind. That is, when we are absorbed in superficial appearances and irrational sensations, the mind is covered and cannot see the depth of creation. Conversely, when the senses are covered, the mind is uncovered as the veils obscuring our spiritual vision are removed, enabling the mind to behold the depth of creation and grasp its inner meaning and purpose. The contrast between the mind and the senses is not a dualism of mind and body. It is not a binary opposition between body and soul. The opposition that St. Maximus is describing does not take place between the mind and the body, but rather between two different minds, an idea that he has once again taken from the theology of St. Paul. In his letter to the Romans, Paul opposes the mind of the flesh to the mind of the spirit. And it is well known that Paul uses the word flesh to refer not to the body, but to the mind or person that is alienated from and hostile to God, Romans 8, 5, 7. 
Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The mind of flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. Conclusion. In St. Maximus the Confessor's Tale of Two Trees, the movement from the tree of knowledge to the tree of life is an image of the mind's progression from the surface of creation to its depth. He teaches us that spiritual progress is not a movement upward or away from creation, but an inward movement, a deepening into the mystery of creation. To enter into this mystery is to find oneself in the presence of the Creator, who transforms us into His own likeness, bestowing upon us His own features, so that we become true children resembling their Father. It is not by chance that questions of sin and redemption unfold around the symbolism of the tree. The tree of knowledge, which is a symbol of creation, was present at and implicated in the fall of man. We sin in relation to a tree. It was therefore only natural that we should also be saved in relation to a tree, through a new relation to the created world, recalling us from exile and granting us access to paradise. It is not surprising then that Christian tradition maintains that the wood of the cross was fashioned from the wood of the tree of life and was planted on the summit of Golgotha, on the very spot where Adam was buried. Maximus the Confessor's vision is more than an intellectual theory. The passions are as real now as they were in the 7th century. Indeed, their power and influence is greater now, being dangerously magnified by technology, which enables the manipulation, exploitation, and abuse of the natural world to a degree without precedent in human history. The passions remain at the heart of the problem, and the need to be free of them remains at the heart of the solution. With the transformation of the mind and the awakening of spiritual consciousness, the broken and divided self is slowly healed and reintegrated. In the light of the Spirit, the mind will come to perceive and know the love of God inscribed on the parchment of creation. As we saw, the perception and knowledge of God is something that transcends the distinction between subject and object. It brings into being a new subject who, in the light of God, sees God in all things and all things in God. It is a dialogical and participatory relationship with God in which the human person is no longer outside of God and nature, but understands himself to be an integral part of both, and thus is free to exercise his vocation in the world without exploiting or trying to control the world. Freed from the illusions of surfaces, he attends to the depth and finds himself engulfed in a joy that cannot be explained, the joy of being one with all things in the hidden ground of God's love. Thank you.